This is the DMT One to One Show, episode 54, on the 3rd of April 2014, a feature on the British Library's Sound Archive with Andy Linehan, Adam Tuvel, and Alex Wilson. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the DMT One to One Show. And uh, today we are here at the British Library, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the conference that happened actually uh, a few days ago here uh, called Keeping Tracks. And I've got uh, you know three of the of the uh, main guys from the Sound Archives here at the library, which is fantastic. Uh, I've got Andy Linhan, uh, the curator of popular music here at the British Library. So hi, Andy, and thanks for joining me. And uh, Adam Tuvel, uh, audiovisual scoping analyst. Uh, here. So hi Adam and uh, Alex Wilson, uh, uh, curator of digital recording. So Hello Andre. Uh, yeah. Great to have you all here and it's a real pleasure to talk about this uh, as I have uh, uh, a long history in, well fairly long but not, not that long really in context in, <laughs> in this space and so I really like to uh, to keep uh, track of it and, and uh, work out what's going on. So uh, Alex, uh, first of all let's talk about the event. Uh, so uh, you were sort of the, the, the main uh, driving force behind it. So w- what uh, got you to, uh, what led you to organize it? It sparked off a about a year ago, Andy, with uh, beggars, the beggars group, Leslie Bleakley of the, the beggars group, came to Andy to look for uh, advice on how to preserve and conserve the beggars archive uh, collections. So, uh, on the back of that, um, a relationship kind of was was nurtured, and we decided that uh, we wanted that to kind of form the focus of a, a day to celebrate what we do and what labels should do what they don't do sure uh, talk about archiving uh not only is things on shelves but you know things uh, on drives <laughs> that, that was i think I've, I've just stolen the title there from adam's talk <laughs> entirely yeah uh so I, I wanted to build the kind of diverse day where we'd get people from uh tech uh talking about archives get uh, actual record labels in the building because i'm quite the, the record closer yeah. myself and we wanted to engage with record labels and get them in the building for the first time of course in, in some some time yeah. that's great and so uh, Andy uh, you uh, as a curator of popular music uh, uh, you must have had uh, uh, some dealings with labels over the years I, I, I'm sure and uh, wh- what have you found over the last few years uh, as far as their attitude has things have things changed are they coming to you for advice on that on that kind of thing I think things have changed. I think generally uh, people have a, a, a far better sense of history these days, mainly because of uh, the kind of social media things where people are kind of putting down the, the events that they do day to day. And that has just given people a better perspective of what matters and what should be recorded for uh, an amount of time. Yeah. Record labels in the past um, have been very much geared to to the present, if you see what I mean, you know, to, to doing what they do at the time. And once a record is out, they move on to the next project. And so they weren't always great at um, uh, looking after their own history until it came to time that uh, it was uh, you know, it, it was the right thing to do to re-release material or to put out commemorative sets. And then they kind of start digging around their archives yeah. and realise really that um, what they done in the past wasn't quite the right thing and of course when uh, they're now digging around looking for files to digitize to put out to uh, new releases and stuff they're actually realizing that there's a lot to be done to get the houses in order and a lot of them are doing it pretty well it yeah. has to be said but it's great that people like uh, beggars came to us uh, first of all and said look we've got all these formats we're not sure how do you do it and taking advice from us and our advice comes as part of uh, an international community of sound archives and so it is uh, you know generally an agreed international standard to which we we operate yeah uh, adam tell me a little bit of, about your work let's backtrack into sort of the history of the library there's a huge uh, uh, sound archive here uh, a variety of formats and so you are uh, in charge of, of looking at the ways in which that uh, sound archive can be preserved and how long it's going to take and sort of the, the structure of that of that uh, arrangement so uh, tell us a little bit more about that yeah so um We've been preserving things, I mean, a, a, as a sound archive for, for many years, and that's always been a process of looking to see what we have in our collections, understanding the risks faced by particular formats, and making sure that the contents of those of those carriers in those formats is preserved for future generations. So that's always been a process of constantly appraising collections, uh, assessing relative risks um, according to criteria like the physical degradation of carriers, so things falling apart, or 
more the technical obsolescence of things. So you might think about a format like mini discs that were popular yeah. around the 90s and not so popular anymore. So I can't go out today and, and buy a new mini disc player. So those recordings that we hold on mini disc are threatened by obsolescence. And we know that in order to provide sustainable access to those recordings in the future, we need to migrate from those carriers to something more stable. So we've been doing that for many years um, to the state of the art format as they come along. And now we're at a stage where we know that uh, digital, i.e. digital files are, are, the, uh, are the way to go, are the, are the cheapest, are the most cost effective and the, the highest quality solution for preserving our collections. So we've just coming to the end of a 12-month scope study project which has uh, assessed our entire collections, performed a complete collection survey across the library. Um, we know now what formats we have, how many items we have and we know how much time it's going to take to be able to migrate those recordings to something more stable. And so uh, looking at uh, the experience that you have as well, it's quite surprising that uh, uh, Beggars was uh, one of the first uh, labels to come to you for advice on this front because uh, it feels like there would have been a lot, uh, there's, a, there's a potential for a lot of synergy between the expertise that you have and, and what the labels might need. So, uh, so would you encourage uh, labels to come to you for advice on, on these kind of matters? Yeah, if we have the time, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, certainly. I, I think, uh, as Andy says, that the work that we do here is not um, something that we have uh, completely created ourselves. There is an international community of archives out there, and we're all kind of bound and we follow the rules that um, the other archives follow as well. Uh, um, so there are um, sources of information out there that we go to, that we contribute to, and that other archives uh, can use as well. And certainly th we'll see record labels hopefully uh, following those sorts of rules in the future and and even feeding back into them so it, it's always a progressive process it's never we'll never know everything um, and it's always a case that we're learning new things and feeding back experience into into the community for other people to use yeah sure and uh, uh, Andy it's interesting actually that uh, Adam was talking a lot about uh, planning uh, when it comes to uh, to the sound archive and uh, how long it's gonna take to archive everything you know have, having a, a real plan as to uh, how how things are going to work, what what tapes are going to degrade first, and all that kind of thing. So on, on that front, I think that's something that uh, labels really should should look at because, uh, as you, as you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, you said that a lot of labels look at archives when they need something for a re-release, and so uh, the, really the de degradation of certain formats is, is a key uh, concern for some of those private companies that have thousands and, and hundreds of thousands of tapes, right? It is, yeah. Um, as as I said, I, I think. Um People are now a lot more aware of this, and they're, they're actually doing you know, quite a lot of work um, in order to sort this out. And, and there are big companies uh, like uh, EMI, for example, that's always had a very, very good archive, and they are similarly, you know, working with organisations like us uh, to make sure that um, their, their their masters and and other tapes from sessions and and, and other recordings are, are in the best possible condition. And yeah, uh, yeah that is very important. Uh, unfortunately, it's an expensive process, so we all know that. It's a downside, right? It's you know, it, it is something that uh, you know, if you are a record label, it, it's not a, an immediately uh, financially lucrative uh, process uh, to take part in. So you've got to be looking at the long term uh, if, if you're doing this. And so it's, uh, it's understandable that it's not the highest priority, but at the same time, people are realizing how important it is. Sure, uh, Alex. Uh, talking about the, the uh, digital side of things, uh, of course, now that we're, we've reached a, a point where uh, we perhaps have. Uh, the one of the best ways I guess uh, uh, to preserve uh, sound files uh, and uh, of course there's going to be advances uh, still but uh, we're reaching the point where any advance is going to be very hard to hear from the from, from the human ear, ears perspective so do you think that's spurring labels also to look again at their archives and say look if we do this once that's going to be the last time we have to do it uh, in terms of an actual transfer or is, is, is that an approach that you think uh, uh, works um, yeah, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what the future holds, really, in terms of audio quality and file formats. Um, all we can do is suggest, and uh, it makes our job easier um, yeah. to uh, accept the highest quality ones we, we can do. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, th there's an argument that, that if, if we, we had such a kind of puritanical uh, viewpoint... Uh, we'd be missing out on a whole swathe of material that goes out hourly, minutely on SoundCloud and Bandcamp. Right, exactly. And blogs and all this kind of exciting digital material that's there that maybe not is um, pure 96, 24 WAVs, but 
we can't really ignore it. No, exactly. And so in, in that context, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, your study that you've been carrying out for the, for the past few months. Yeah, uh, so it's a six-month project. Uh, it's part of a kind of wider British Library uh, um, policy to migrate and uh, make the transition from physical things to digital things. You know, the, there won't, there'll never be a day when the British Library won't collect physical artifacts, be they journals, newspapers, magazines, books, or records. Um, but it was my job to kind of get a handle on how we can possibly make sense of the, the dizzying amounts of digital music that's out there. Um, we're, we're going slowly because uh, we're a sound archive and uh, we need to make sure everything's done correctly. Um, so the first part of call is to um, kind of uh, create a pilot project with a handful of labels, uh, key UK independents, to get them to donate high quality material, um, nice and standardised, right to spec, all that kind of thing. And then kind of the last six months I've been teasing out into other areas that possibly we can, we can explore, such as uh, Bandcamp and blogs and streaming and all this kind of uh, ephemeral stuff. To yeah, sure. uh, I say ephemeral, but ephemeral to our kind of uh, experience. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, if it feels like the more we move towards the digital experience, the more we lose track of our past in a sense, mm. even though our past is right in front of us because we we don't really have a way of archiving things. I mean, even from a purely social media standpoint, you know, anything you should do right now is online and you, in theory, you have a way to track back everything you've done for the past five years, but nobody's really keeping that as, as in, in, in any, yeah. you know, a coin size form. And so that makes it very difficult if you actually lose everything to, uh, to get it back. So Yeah, well, I've always felt one of the most refreshing things about working here is we, we, when we're not always chasing the thrill of the new and the, right. the you know, the, we must be on top of uh, archiving the hottest, newest thing. We, you know, we can just take a step back and, and start to realize that let's do it properly and uh, yeah think, and it, Andy, think about it yeah sure Andy, uh, uh, the library I I is not really u just uk focused of course so you, you have a, a worldwide focus right um yeah we the library uh, tries to represent um you know in terms of our sound recordings we try and get uh, a copy of everything commercially released in the uk right uh, that's that's historically been the, been the the idea sure obviously the there are f uh, very very blurred edges around that nowadays uh defining what is a, a commercial release and the uk um but uh, we um we yeah we, we try to get a copy of everything released in the uk but we also have a a, a world and traditional music um collection uh, and a curator a couple of curators who try to represent um music and sound recordings from uh, from other cultures so we have we yeah, we, we have a global collection, but uh, the focus is, is uh, most of it is, is on the UK. Yeah, sure. And, and uh, talking about uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what uh, Alex was saying uh, about SoundCloud and all those different platforms, that, that becomes, a, I guess, a core issue, right? Because uh, exactly. uh, you have uh, sounds coming from all the world. So what, what are yes. you going to do? Are you going to geolocate them? Are you going to filter them? And what happens? On, on exactly. The yeah, that, 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 that's, that, that's the really large issue that we are, that we are looking at addressing. Yeah. Uh, we haven't got close <laughs> to making a decision about it yet. And, you know, there are, there are plenty of things where, you know, I, I always say that I could go home tonight, get out my laptop with a bit of software, and I could put something on SoundCloud and say, I've released a recording. Is that a recording that's worth collecting uh, yeah. by the British Library? Um, it's very, very early days in the decision-making process as to how to uh, how to work that sort of thing out. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, let's talk about accessibility. So, uh, uh, Adam, fr fr from your end, you know, of course, you're worried about preservation and mm. preserving those assets. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, how do you think the those assets are best experienced after they are preserved. You know, what's your take on that? Yeah, it's quite difficult, isn't it? Because uh, they're often viewed as different drivers for things, preservation and access. So I think what we're, what we're doing really is providing sustainable access uh, for a start. So by preserving stuff, by making it digital, we can ensure that it's accessible in the future. But there's also off, uh, an immediate benefit. So I can take my open reel tape and create an audio file out of it. Um, and instantly I can make that thing available if I've um, got the wherewithal to do it. So... Um, we are allowed to uh, make any of our recordings available on site at the British Library, so anyone can come in and listen to anything in our collections if it's not embargoed in any way. Obviously, copyright is an issue for making stuff available externally. Um, we do have collections that are free from copyright or that we've cleared the copyright for, so um, our sounds website 
um, has around 50, 60,000 of those online at the moment. And that's something we would want to move towards is, is getting as much out there as possible because that's why we have it and that's what it's for. Um, I suppose, interestingly, uh, there has been a slight um, shift in the, in the work that we do down here recently um, to include things that support audiovisual recordings. And by that, I mean um, offering some sort of means of interacting with the original physical object. So one of the dangers of digitizing something, say uh, an LP, is that I could put it on a turntable and create a nice audio file from it and, and, and play that to someone, but they wouldn't get that experience of looking at the sleeve, reading the liner notes, doing all that kind of thing. So we are looking towards doing uh, digital imaging of stuff alongside our digitization of audio and video so that whoever can uh, experience that recording can also flick through a booklet, look at the artwork, and we consider those cultural artifacts in their own right. That's awesome. Uh, and uh, uh, Alex, uh, talking about that and the way that you've uh, working with a company like Metable, for example, mm -hmm. uh, with this new sort of uh, trial project, uh, uh, you're integrating various sources of metadata uh, into into this uh, beta program to, to try and work out how to yeah. Yeah. Uh, arrange uh, <laughs> sounds in this digital space. So uh, so on that front, uh, uh, how did that relationship come about and, and uh, what, what are the plans on that? Um, the, the the kind of driver for that was um, for many years we've been getting uh, data from various sources, paying for data from uh, like Search Muse, Rovi, Rovi National Discography. Yeah, this this dates back twenty odd years, I guess. Longer, probably. Yeah, Andy will know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and increasingly, I guess, uh, we've been getting more and more disgruntled with the, the quality of data from, from those sources, um, especially at the, the kind of cost we were, we're paying for it. Uh, so, you know, in, in today's uh, internet space, uh, there are so many user communities which um, are giving much better data than, than we used to get. Uh, our accession team, our cataloging team use Discogs as, you know, as the, their next go to uh and music brains is free as well. And music brains uh and, and decibel, you know, they they use these uh processes, uh these databases as as the de facto means of getting better information than what we have when a box of records comes to their desk. Um so I I, I kind of uh came upon the idea that uh instead of actually going out to the, the websites where you that we use their open APIs to kind of plug into that that ecosystem and somewhere down the line I'd like to think we can feed back our own long uh, long established catalogues and our long established data and feed it back out and create some kind of nice cycle whereby it's not just a one way street um, <laughs> sure so the, the Metable project uh, is, is fundamentally going to um, enable us to do that easily we don't have the, the development time or resource to, to create a nice interface that any user, any staff user can uh, really get stuck into these APIs yeah. but, but also uh, the Metable platform will allow us to um, really engage with the digital supply chain and deal with uh, standards like DDX and uh, work with companies like CI and The Orchard and really yeah. work with labels properly, professionally and act as a kind of pseudo uh, online store, really. Yeah, sure. Uh, Andy, let's, let's backtrack to sort of the early days of, uh, of uh, metadata and uh, what was happening when you were receiving those commercial releases. So how, how did that process work? Were you inputting all the information in yourself, uh, you know, up to like 10, 15, 20 years ago? Uh, were you ingesting some uh, some data directly from from the labels? How did that work? Um, what used to happen was we had an arrangement with the MCPS, Mechanical Copyright Protection Society, and um, to be brief, we set up a database with them called National Discography. And what happened was the the MCPS uh, they they administer royalty payments and. They were getting um, uh, data in, in paper copy, you know, uh, pieces of paper sent to them saying, we're releasing this record, these are the tracks on it, these are the people who were involved, these are the people who wrote it, and payments were made on that basis. They were finding increasingly that this data was erroneous, uh, not correct, and for various reasons, the, the record when it came out had different tracks on or, or, or whatever. And they realized that we were trying to get a copy of every record in the UK. And so if they could actually see the physical disc and look at it and see what's on it and then create their record from that, then that is uh, the, you know, the guaranteed way of ensuring that they were doing had the right details. And it also worked for us because they were building a database 
which reflected what we had. And so we downloaded data from them into uh, peri periodically into our own catalog uh, that was data created from the actual physical items that we had. And that okay. system worked pretty well for a long time. Uh, we then, uh, for various reasons, MCPS uh, went their own way and uh, we got bought data in from commercial operators. And again, we were finding that that was doing a job, but as Alex said, really wasn't um, increasingly suited to, to the way we work. And so we looked for other ways of doing it. And to be honest, you know, when we're looking at the, the, the whole digital realm, then uh, the question of metadata really brought it home. And so we kind of looked at what can we do? And so we used some of the money that we used to buy data with to fund some of the um, development that, uh, work that Alex's project was doing. That's great. That's great. And uh, uh, Adam, uh, here we have uh, how many studios? Ten. Ten studios, uh, which is great. Uh, that they all are working uh, towards this, the sound uh, pr preservation uh, projects. And so uh, we were looking with uh, Alex earlier, a few of the LPs, and uh, uh, some of them were very sketchily marked, or there was no marks at all on the LPs. And, and so how do you deal with that side of things when there is uh, very little or no metadata at all to go with the asset that you have? <laughs> yeah, um, metadata is uh, quite an important thing for preservation, so um, we like to know uh, what we're digitizing before we digitize it, ideally. Um, in those cases where we don't have uh, any information written on the label, that's where people like Andy come in uh, who have uh, curatorial expertise, let's say, uh, subject specialism in particular areas. So we have... It's <laughs> encyclopedic knowledge, exactly. So uh, we can... Uh, go to our subject specialists and we have specialist curators uh, across the breadth of all disciplines um, and, and go to them and I can play something to our classical music curator and he'll tell me what it is um, so in that way we can we can get our catalogue records enhanced sometimes we just won't know what we have um, and there is a, a percentage of our collections certainly our unpublished collections um, that have come to us for various reasons as part of archives or as individually uh, individual items and, and and we won't know what they have and they will stay unidentified until we can find a way of identifying them um, I think plugging into things like discogs and music brains is is really plugging into the idea of, uh, of crowdsourcing for metadata and that's quite an exciting thing for us so certainly in the future we'll be looking to putting things out there that we can to uh, try and uh, get some subject specialist knowledge from outside of the library because there are a lot of geeks out there that will uh, <laughs> be able to help I'm sure yeah exactly and so uh, I wanted to finish guys by asking your uh, thoughts on your particular field of expertise uh, uh, going forward uh, so what, what are you excited about that's happening here at the library what, what are your uh, plans uh, uh, in your particular departments uh, just so that we can uh, finish on a, on a futuristic note and, and see what's going on here right okay well there's a lot, there's a lot going on i mean there's a, a number of projects and things that we're trying to uh, develop uh, we're kind of putting in for funding on Projects such as the history of uh, the development of uh, drum and bass and grime uh, in conjunction with the University of East London. We're looking at um, uh, a, a project with the University of Westminster uh, called Bass Culture about black British music. And we're also looking at um, uh, trying to get funding for a film on the, um, a project on the history of pop music video. Um, the other things that I'm actually looking forward to are uh, basically expanding the, the, the kind of reach of what we get. It's something that we're constantly doing, is um, discovering new labels, talking to old labels, and getting additional labels to donate to the Sound Archive and being part of it. And whether they do that with physical releases or digital releases, uh, that's a message we really want to get across, is that uh, looking into the future, we want to increase our coverage of uh, UK labels, particularly independents, and particularly labels now um, that are doing digital only releases that we won't get a physical item for. So, uh, you know, the future is, is essentially more of the same, but branching out in, 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 uh, with a few interesting projects, I think. Uh, Alex, uh, in terms of uh, how uh, the six month project that is, is just happening might influence the work of the library in the future, what would you like to see happen? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, Adam might be able to. We were only talking about this just yesterday. I, I mean, the Metable uh, platform is 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 a real exciting development, I think, and hopefully we can get that to a stage where it's workable uh, to a basic level, so um, we can start accepting 
a, a steady drip of digital releases from a, a trusted band of labels. Uh, we can start using the API functionality and working with that in more and more sophisticated ways. Uh, there's even talk that we can maybe integrate the, the system in ways in which we preserve and digitize and, and, and really start building on this thing as a as a powerful means in which the way the library can work. Yeah. Um, I think it, it, it looks good that um, we're, we're, we're working with allies like Music Brains, with Discogs, Decibel, and with labels, uh, significant labels like Beggars, uh, and that's that's only going to make uh, the British Library Sound Archive uh, more important than it ever has been, I guess. That's great. Awesome. And uh, Adam, uh, finally, let's uh, uh, chat about the uh, you know the future for for the preservation side. You you mentioned this uh, twelve month study that's looking at how many assets there are, how long it's going to take to archive them, and hopefully it's going to generate uh, some more uh, opportunities for funding as well uh, as people realize how much work there is to do here. So uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, that's part of the reason for doing it. Um, certainly we will need, we'll need funding um, in order to preserve our collections responsibly. So uh, really the driver behind doing the scoping study project was the fact that there is consensus internationally that we have between 10 and 20 years in which to preserve our sound collections dig digitally. And after that point, it's either going to become impossible due to those factors of degradation and obsolescence or <coughs> very costly because we won't be able to get the equipment. Um, so uh, we know now how many items we have and we know that we're not going to be able to get those preserved within 15 years with our current resources so we're going to look into carrying on as we are in the interim so keeping our preservation uh, work going with the resources we have and doing the best we can but we're really looking to upscale massively in the next few years in order to be able to uh, preserve our collections and make them available for future generations so that's the aim yeah. finance pending <laughs> Awesome. That's awesome. And I'm sure there's going to be a, an army of sound engineers that will be very happy about that. <laughs> uh, finding new employment. And so, uh, guys, it was a pleasure talking to you. And uh, where uh, can we find the more information about the Sound Archive? Is there a specific site or a subsite uh, within the library's uh, We'll, we'll each do a sales pitch. Okay, uh, yeah, sure. Comes to the British Library Sound Archive. As Adam uh, mentioned, uh, I guess the first protocol is to get a flavor and, and an idea, a nice open idea, no matter where you're... Uh, geographically located-ish, uh, is BL sounds sounds.bl uk is that, that the url if you sound it sounds in british library you'll get there and that's a, an, an open website where rights cleared recordings of uh, 50,000 plus that most can access and it's, it's awesome. across the collections very diverse uh, from the sound of uh, probably a natterjack toad to the sound of uh, west african drumming i guess awesome and so on so andy what, what would you suggest uh what I'd suggest is if, if you want more detail and uh, particularly if you're a record label that wants to um, you know, uh, contribute, you can use the email address popmusic at bl.uk and that will come through to me and uh, I'll tell you how to do it. Awesome. Uh, Adam, anything else to point out? I think if you're interested in uh, what we have in our collections, not just digital stuff, but physical as well, then go to the BL website and have a browse through our catalogue so you can refine by audio and video recordings and, and see what we have and come in and listen to stuff if you like. And of course, I would also mention that if you are a tech company, uh, of which there are many that listen to the show, uh, that uh, has interesting APIs that could augment the experience, I guess, uh, uh, also get in touch uh, with the sound archives and it could be interesting to see if you can work with them. Uh, well, it was a real pleasure having you on. Thanks so much for your time. And uh, Alex hopefully is going to give us a little tour of the studios here and we might record a few outtakes that are going to uh, end up uh, at the end of this show. So we're down in the, uh, the British Library Sound Archives uh, Conservation Centre. This is uh, Low Ground Floor. This is where all the sound archive transfer preservation work happens this is a typical studio um in here tony who's not around presently um he's working through uh core screw acetate discs uh lacquers um so a lot of these are unmarked uh so this is from the 24th of february 1949 um so the engineer here would uh would decide upon the the correct stylus uh, on how to transfer the discs and use a couple of turntables um, a kind of key principle of what we do um, down here is to transfer the disc um, kind of warts and all um, so a, a direct copy with all the pops the cracks the, the hiss the crackles to, to give it a truest representation of uh, what that disc actually sounds like okay, cool. awesome. yeah. so there's no 
There's not a great deal of cleanup involved in that. No, well, for our preservation copy, for the copy that goes into our long-term deep storage, this will be a, a direct copy, uh, the most accurate representation of what that disc actually sounded like. Uh, we, we'll do some uh, general cleaning beforehand of the, the physical artifact, but in terms of uh, software processing, uh, that would happen um, only if requested by a record label, say, or for broadcast, we'd, we'd do some deep popping and de-clicking, that kind of thing. Uh, so, wh where are we now? What is this? Okay, this is uh, the wax cylinder transfer facility we've got here at the British Library. Um, surrounding us here, you'll see numerous uh, cylinders, some of which make up our uh, three and a half thousand-ish commercial wax cylinder discs we have. Um, this universal cylinder player here is a bespoke item that was built for us. This is not obviously not period specific. Um, this is built to transfer these wonderful discs. These particular Edison amber rolls, I believe. The one that we've got loaded up in here is a, a blue amber roll, which is later, Eve. Later. Yeah. Yeah. Later. 1912, <laughs> I believe. Um, so here goes. We're going to watch the magic happen. Awesome. Created a riot, it took four policemen to keep the girl quiet and when I stroll down the pier, all the girls cry, what? He's just come from his yacht, he must be some welfare big punk, and when they gather around me and ask to share my lot, then I promise to take the young darlings a sail on the beautiful yacht I've not got. Wah, wah. So I'm here with uh, Kevin Lemagne, one of the engineers uh, at the British Library. So hi Kevin, and, and what kind of uh, tapes do you transfer here? Uh, we do uh, all sorts of uh, open reel tape, uh, mainly in this room. Uh, we do quarter inch, um, we're, we're set up for quarter inch tape machines, but we've got a multi-track machine outside, and uh, we've got different head configurations for different types of tape we come across. Are you yeah. going to a particular batch of tapes right now? Uh, yes, this is a collection from the World in Traditional uh, Music um, Department. Uh, it's mainly uh, music from uh, Romania, which was recorded by um, a field recordist um, back in the 80s, I believe. That's amazing. You must you must listen to an incredible amount of uh, <laughs> varied stuff. <laughs> yes. Well, but funnily enough, as well is because uh, there's four running at a time. You obviously can't listen to all of them at the same time. Sure. But so you don't really get all of it. Um, but um, yeah, there's some very interesting things that come up, including uh, on, on one of these tapes there was some Romanian propaganda music. So um, <laughs> from Ceausescu era, I guess. So it was uh, it was quite impressive. Cool, awesome. Well, thanks so much. Great. So this is our final stop for this awesome tour of the British Library Sound Archive and, and, and the back end of what's going on. So where are we now? Okay, yeah, my, the final stop of the tour, probably the first place uh, where all our engineers head to before they start transferring discs or tapes. Uh, so this is the lab. Um, I've got a couple of key... Uh, elements of our arsenal here. So this is the Keith Monk's uh, cleaning machine, yeah. uh, which is for shell and vinyl, and it allows us to, to really get deep into the grooves and to, to work out excess dirt and dust and grime uh, through a solution that comes through these, uh, these, these uh, teeth here, and then is sucked up by this uh, kind of hoover stylus that is on a string here. Uh, one thing I always like showing off about this wonderful machine is that although it does an incredible job, it is uh, 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 quite uh, interesting inside. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, so it's just solutions and motors, but yeah, a wonderful kind of industry standard machine that helps us uh, take the first layer of uh, years of uh, dust and grime off our discs. If uh, we want to go further, we would use the ultrasonic bath here. Uh, there's a handily preloaded uh, 78 disc on there already, so that the disc would be lowered in, and ultrasonic vibrations will really, really get deep down and uh, work off any tough grease and grime. Uh, we've got a microscope here. This is used by uh, uh, engineers to assess the, the groove walls of that disc and, and then for them to decide on which uh, stylus to use to transfer. Uh, underneath, quite unassuming, uh, is the hotbox oven, yes. um, uh, as it's called. Um, 
this is for magnetic tape when when it um, is stored poorly over time it uh, acquires um, uh, sticky shed syndrome so uh, a way of alleviating that is a slow bake uh, in an oven like this at a very very low temperature uh, for, for some hours and that, uh, that enables magnetic tape to be transferred uh, without stickiness which, which is great for us Awesome. And uh, I, I do love the smell of uh, tapes when they come out of the of the baking oven. <laughs> I don't know why, but uh, that's something I'll always, I'll, I'll always remember about baking tapes, <laughs> the smell of them when they come out. And well, thanks so much, uh, Alex. It was a real pleasure getting this tour of the library, and I'm sure the listeners of DMT are going to really enjoy it. So thanks so much. Thanks, Andre. Cheers. And that's all for this week. Digital Music Trends would like to thank the British Library for the hospitality and for providing us with a sneak peek of what goes on in the sound archives.